One of the long-standing questions in cosmology concerns the origin of the universe and whether it has always been approximately the same in all directions. This is what cosmologists call isotropic. After all, today, on the largest scale, the universe looks very similar in all directions, with approximately the same properties. But has it always been like this? What happened 13.8 billion years ago? And the answer is that something was happening. Of course, we don't know this for sure yet, but we already have a certain amount of knowledge about cosmology, gravity, and quantum mechanics in order to make models that have every chance of fixing at least part of the truth. And today we will talk about chaos, not on Earth, but in the universe. But how could chaos have created the universe? Let's try to delve into this question and find the answer. Interestingly, this is a rather old idea, dating back at least to the ancient philosopher Lucretia, who lived before our era and was already comprehended in the 18th century by the philosopher David Hume, as well as by the physicist Ludwig Boson in the 19th century. Moreover, even in Greek mythology, he believed that the universe arose out of chaos. In fact, the word chaos itself comes from the Greek word meaning abyss. This void, devoid of any features, is often represented as a kind of ocean, for example in Babylonian and Japanese mythologies. The same motif can be traced in ancient Egyptian, Polynesian myths and even in Mayan beliefs. This is quite interesting, because at that time, probably, people jumped through the fire in the skin of a deer, calling for rain. But nevertheless it is a fact. Yes, as we have seen, people of different eras had the idea that the early cosmos was a disorderly mixture, which was somehow ordered through time. Today, when science has gone far ahead, this ancient episode of the universe is called the Chaotic Cosmology Program. Well, to begin with, let's take a little look at what a disorderly mixture means, what does chaos mean in general? And for this we will give a simple and illustrative example with a pendulum. What happens to it when we set it in motion? Yes, it begins to oscillate, gradually decreasing the amplitude, and after a while the pendulum stops. Where did the energy of the pendulum go? That's right, she was taken away by tricky air molecules. But why doesn't the opposite happen? Why can't lazy molecules get together and give energy to the pendulum again? The answer is simple. The desire of the world for chaos is a fundamental property of nature. That is, the directional movement of the pendulum particles turns into a chaotic movement of air molecules. Just as the directional flow of water will sooner or later turn into a chaotic jet with turbulent vortices and intertwining streams. Physicists use a quantity called the entropy of a system to measure chaos. The greater the entropy, the less ordered the system is. In the state of equilibrium, entropy is maximal. Boltzmann in the 19th century proved a theorem that states that in a closed system entropy always increases with time. For example, let's take a helium balloon. Let's put it in the corner of the room. Then it bursts. The gas will spread throughout the room after a while, filling it evenly. Thus, the entropy of the gas increases to a maximum, and no matter how long we wait, the helium will never gather back into a sphere in the corner of the room. This indicates the irreversibility of processes in our world. Well, let's take a look at each ball separately. The fact is that for each ball we can find out the accuracy, its speed and coordinates, as well as the force acting on it. From Newton's second law, we can learn the acceleration and motion of each individual particle, and if we turn back time, the law will not change its shape. This means that the movement of each individual ball is also reversible. From the final state of the ball, you can understand where it came from and how it moves. But the movement of all the balls taken together turns out to be irreversible. French mathematician Andrin noticed an interesting thing about Umkara for a certain type of systems. As a result of the evolution of these systems, over time they returned to their original state, although initially it seemed that they were striving only towards chaos. Yes, indeed, the gas from the ball will not gather back into one pile, but what if we wait even longer? What if the Ankara cycle for such a system is very large, there are whole cosmological models based on the Ankara return hypothesis. 
One of them belongs to the famous mathematician Pin Rose. In his opinion, the universe first inflates, then collapses back, then explodes again, inflates and collapses again, repeating exactly the previous cycle. Statistical mechanics implies that, given sufficient time, systems close to equilibrium will spontaneously transition to a state with lower entropy. Locally reverses the thermodynamic arrow of time. It was Boltzmann who realized long ago that the second law of thermodynamics, which states that the entropy of a closed system never decreases, is not an absolute law. For clarity, let's imagine an ice cube in a glass of water that is completely isolated from the rest of the universe. Our thought experiment will last indefinitely. And by the way, you're Peter Pan and you ignore gravity. Traditional thermodynamics predicts that an ice cube will melt. And in a few minutes we will get a glass of colder water. We continue to wait for quite a long time, levitating over the cup. And now statistical mechanics predicts that the ice cube will eventually form again. If we saw such a miraculous phenomenon, we would come to the conclusion that the evolution in time of the process of reforming an ice cube would be with high probability approximately equivalent to the reversal of the process in time. Thus, we are observing a series of consecutive statistically unlikely events, rather than a single instantaneous very unlikely event. And now let's move this experiment to a larger scale. Let's imagine that you're willing to wait almost forever to see something like the Big Bang randomly oscillate in empty space. How will this actually happen? Based on the ice example, it won't be a sudden detonation in which nothing turns into a Big Bang. Rather, it will be exactly the same as the observed history of our universe, only reproduced in reverse order. It just so happens that there is nothing in the laws of physics that distinguishes a crazy story about fluctuations leading to a large compression, and a completely ordinary story, evolution from the Big Bang. One is the opposite of the other. And after all, the fundamental laws of physics do not determine the direction of time. Therefore, we may wonder whether such processes help explain the universe in which we actually live. Not really yet. And since we don't have enough time to experiment for a long time, such arguments are mostly in the field of philosophy. Or we need to look for other solutions and better understand how entropy works. Yes, today we can only measure the observable universe, but we cannot look beyond it. Consequently, the real universe on a larger scale may well be anisotropic, and its inhomogeneities have long been thrown out of the dimension due to spatial expansion. We know so little about space, probably only 2%. The universe is like a majestic castle stretching into the sky, with towers, bridges, thrones, halls, perhaps by his king and subjects. But, apparently, humanity has not emerged from the smallest dungeon of this fortress.
we are waiting for an interstellar journey with you. Today we will look into the future where a unique expedition is sent for a long 10,000 days to the very Tau Ceti. But first, a little digression. To study the final station where our starship will arrive. The Tau Ceti system enters our nearest stellar environment and the light of the sun reaches it in 12 years. This system ranks third in distance from the solar system, second only to Alpha Centauri at a distance of 4.3 light years and Epsilon Eridani at a distance of 10,005 tenths of light years. But Staukitanos is 11.9 light years apart. Earth, by the way, it is visible to the naked eye in the southern hemisphere in the constellation of the whale. The star is slightly smaller than the sun in size, relatively stable, with slight fluctuations in brightness. Its spectrum shows low metallicity and, therefore, the presence of giant planets is unlikely in this planetary system. According to the results of the search for exoplanets, four planets with orbital periods of 20, 49, 168 and 642 days revolve around the star. The values of the minimum masses of the detected planets are 1 whole 7 tenths, 1 whole 8 tenths, 3 whole 9 tenths and 3 whole 9 Earth masses, respectively. The nearest planets, designated as G and H, are of little interest to us, since it orbits too close to its star. But the planets I and F are quite close to the habitable zone. The habitable zone, of course, is a conditional concept. The climate on the planet strongly depends on its atmosphere. The planet receives about the same amount of heat as Venus, which may have been suitable for habitation until the greenhouse catastrophe occurred. In turn, the planet's F as much as Mars, which was probably habitable until it lost almost the entire atmosphere. Planet F is most likely to be suitable for life. Such a heavy planet should have a thick enough atmosphere that can make it more hospitable than early Mars, which once had rivers flowing into the seas. But Tau Ceti has aggravating circumstances, although not standing fatal, like red dwarfs. Measurements made by the ALMA submillimeter interferometer showed that there is quite a lot of dust around the star. The field belt stretched from 10 to 60 astronomical units. There is an order of magnitude more dust there than in the solar system, and the dust itself seems to be harmless, but where it is, there are steroids, which also turn out to be significantly more than ours. This is somewhat similar to the search for an opera, only more dense and suitable closer to the star. But here again, unknown circumstances are important. What is the entropy of the belt of that distant system? In other words, how dynamically relaxed it is, how elongated the orbits are, and what is the spread? Well, we'll find out. There is no time to wait, we are going on a long journey. So, 2139th year, day 1. The final point of arrival of our travelers has been selected. Tau Ceti F is a super-Earth with a confirmed radius twice that of Earth. Given the mass of the planet, the force of gravity is more than acceptable for humans. A dense atmosphere has also been confirmed, maintaining an optimal temperature for a variety of complex forms of life, including for humans. The field belt with steroids does not cross the orbit of the planet. Earth 2.0 has been found, and today we are flying to it. The interstellar spacecraft, the Star Whale, has been assembled for several years in the orbit of artificial Earth satellites from separate modules delivered by heavy rockets, and we put them into high orbit with the help of a reusable orbital tug. For the convenience of the work and life of the builders in orbit, a heavy orbital station called the Family was created. And now the first colonists of the Earth begin to visit the Star Whale, built by the forces of all mankind. Their total number is 136 people, of which 68 men and 68 women are equally aged from 27 to 30 years. The entire trip to the Tau Ceti system will take 28 years or 10,000 days. For the convenience of the flight and so that people do not age much on a long journey, half of the crew is put into a state of hibernation and sleeps for 14 years, then to wake up and replace their colleagues who have been working on board the ship all this time. There is no return back to Earth. This is a one-way expedition, 
since its purpose is to establish a colony settlement on Daukita F, the seventh day of the flight. 68 crew members are already in special cryocapsules and are in a state of prolonged hibernation. Doctors check the condition of sleeping crew members, their vital signs. In order to reach the desired planet in a relatively short period of 28 years, various scientific and industrial associations have worked out in detail and built an ultra-large spacecraft capable of reaching the nearest stars, which are now taking our colonists further and further from Earth. This is a nuclear pulse ship, and braking on it is provided by a magnetic sail. The project is based on the ideas of a pulse thermonuclear engine, when using the detonation of small nuclear charges and the reflection of reaction products by a powerful magnetic field of high power, due to which there is a reactive force pushing the ship forward. A giant superconducting ring is placed in the aft part of the spaceship, which creates a magnetic mirror of the required configuration. In its focus, a continuous detonation of a thermonuclear charge of sufficient power is carried out every 0.2 seconds. The resulting high temperature plasma and light radiation is reflected by a magnetic mirror and discarded as a jet stream. According to the project, the star whale should accelerate to a maximum speed of 150,000 km per second in three and a half years, which corresponds to half the speed of light. Day 35. Engineers, doctors and specialists in such fields as artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, psychology and many others on Earth have completed a basic course on the structure and functioning of all parts of the spacecraft, since in a critical situation any crew member should be able to cope with this or that problem, as well as understand how to eliminate it. At the moment, a scheduled check of the ship's power supply is taking place, which performs four nuclear reactors with long estimated service lives in flight. A supply of fissile material is stored on board the spaceship, which should be enough on average for a hundred years of flight. 320,000 nuclear charges for the propulsion system are placed on the ship's structure in eight special containers, each of which is equipped with a cooling system and a so-called revolver feed system. After the acceleration is completed, the containers will be fired back. The ship is also supposed to be protected from the residual radiation of nuclear engines and interstellar radiation and dust, which weighs about 800 tons. 245th day of flight. The crew corrects the whale's course. In order to enter Saturn's orbit for the first gravitational maneuver. And after a few days, the sleepless colonists were very lucky. They can personally admire the beautiful winged gas giant. Saturn's maneuver has been completed successfully, and the ship is gaining even more speed in outer space, leaving behind a fading star named the Sun, to one day see and settle next to the same one, but already too far away to return. 653rd day of flight. The star whale has been on full self-sufficiency since the first day of its flight, since there are no opportunities to replenish consumables. Closed regenerative biotechnical life support systems based on physicochemical processes provide normal conditions for the stay of our colonists. Periodically, crew members carry out checks of oxygen supply systems, water supply, cleaning of the atmosphere, adjusting its temperature, humidity, and much more. In such a closed life support system, waste transformation is used with the help of aerobic microorganisms, biofilters and aerotanks in order to obtain nutrient solutions for photoreactors with algae and higher plants in greenhouses. In several modules on the ship, astronauts develop and maintain plant greenhouses that provide oxygen and food in the form of greens and vegetables. The closed ecological system functions as follows. In the system, the pump mixes the water coming from the water collector with waste products. This mixture will be crushed in a mill. Next, oxygen is injected into the mixture, and it passes through a filter made of mahogany bark fibers, in which bacteria and protozoa absorb part of the nutrients contained in it. Next, the mixture enters the aquarium with fish, eating harmful microorganisms in this ecological system. 
Passing through the membrane diffuser, the mixture is cleaned of toxic impurities and carbon dioxide and separated from water vapor. The main part of the water returns to the pump in the described cycle. The smaller part, containing inorganic and nutrients with a high concentration, periodically enters the greenhouse. Plants in the greenhouse absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen, which returns to the cabin. 1216th day of flight, the colonists on the whale are heading for Neptune in order to accelerate to maximum speed with the help of another gravitational maneuver. Through the portholes, the crew members observe the last planet of their natal abode of the solar system. During the entire flight, photos and videos are taken to collect data as personal archives, as well as to transfer them to the ground. The spacecraft is equipped with everything necessary not only for work, but also for recreation and leisure activities in free time. Psychologists lead separate groups of people to maintain a healthy emotional environment on board. 1300th day of flight. The necessary speed gained for interstellar flight and our star whale is rapidly sailing in the cosmic ocean, inexorably shortening thousands of kilometers. Meanwhile, the colonists continue to live and work as before. Several couples are already waiting for replenishment. They are more likely than everyone else to undergo medical preventive examinations to monitor their health. There are also sports complexes on board to maintain physical health. Despite the fact that the ship is equipped with artificial gravity systems. 1543rd day of flight. The first man in outer space was born. Mom and baby are feeling great which was immediately reported to Earth. The colonists do not feel a shortage of water and food. In modules designed for farming, plants and vegetables are successfully continued to be grown with the help of aqua and hydroponics, since with the increase in the number of crew members, the need for them increases. 3857th day of flight. There is a wonderful library on board the whale into the servers of which a huge amount of very different literature has been uploaded. Several crew members are currently resting, reading great classics. Someone may be immersed in a computer simulation with a lot of games and applications. Some meditate in Tetris or have conversations with others, train pets and pet fish. In general, not bad at all. 4961st day of flight. The mission of the first colonists ends and they begin to take the sleeping crew members out of the ship. At first, they help the newly awakened to undergo a medical examination. They will get used to it better on board the ship and transmit all the necessary information on work. Children born on the ship are assigned to groups. They continue to study, gaining the necessary knowledge in various fields. In particular, knowledge about the earth, its history and cultural heritage is taught by a separate science. 6783rd day of flight. On board the spaceship, there are various 3D printers available for a wide variety of printing, ranging from food to the necessary parts and tools for routine repairs. Most of the flight control, course correction of the spacecraft is assigned to artificial intelligence. The Star Whale is sailing on full autopilot. The crew members only monitor the data and check the course coordinates. Artificial intelligence gives instructions for performing complex tasks or repairing parts of the ship, as it is able to quickly search and organize information. Artificial intelligence is also used for continuous monitoring and tracking of minimal changes in the health status of crew members. It also helps to take measures in time and avoid serious consequences. So any crew member will always get advice on how to prevent headaches or how to get rid of insomnia. Doctors, together with artificial intelligence, successfully conduct pregnancies and deliver babies. In addition to all this, artificial intelligence also has a social role to communicate with crew members during their long flight. That is why the developers have added a facial recognition function and a human element in the form of different emotions on the screen. This is how you can recognize sadness and help. 9269th day of flight. There are two years left until the arrival of Dao Kita in the system. Preparation begins for the start of breaking. 
A magnetic sail will be used to create resistance to the interstellar plasma medium. Everything worked out. The crew rejoices. 9970th day of flight. A month before Dao Kita F enters orbit, the sleeping crew members are brought out of the state of cybernation. During sleep, the aging processes were slowed down as much as possible, so their age at the time of arrival does not exceed 44 years. Children born earlier are on average 20 23 years old, and the age of those born later is from 8 to 13 years. But this is not a complete composition of people for colonization. Hundreds of small frozen human embryos have been sleeping on board the Star Whale all this time, which will receive life upon the successful completion of the mission and the construction of the first colony on a new planet. We reach Daukita in 10,000 days. The ship enters the orbit of a distant planet. There are no tracking signals yet. Surprisingly, the data is confirmed. Water, carbon dioxide, methane, oxygen, and ozone were detected. And all this on the only planet in the Tau Ceti system suitable for life. Just like Earth. Perhaps the new planet is inhabited by intelligent beings, organisms that absolutely look different. Meanwhile, automatic probes are descending to the planet to explore territories, take samples, as well as robots that begin building the first homes for settlers. After a time on the descent vehicle, the first group of people heads to a new home. Inhaling deeply the air favorable for breathing, rejoicing in the warmth of the new sun and touching the yet unknown, new, but very pleasant to the touch vegetation. The colonists rejoice and congratulate each other. The long flight really brought together a variety of people and made them the first interstellar family. A wonderful ending. But the truth is that things may end differently. You may be surprised, but hundreds of earthquakes occur on Earth every day. Most of them are in the form of small shocks so small that people do not feel them. But from time to time, stronger ones also occur, as it was on the 6th of February 2023 in the south of Turkey and Syria, where an earthquake of magnitude 7 as many as 8 tenths of a point occurred, which killed tens of thousands of people. And it's terrible. I would like to express my gratitude to everyone who participated and is participating in the rescue of people. You know, you're a hero. This is an example of what really needs to be done in a world gripped by tragedies, and not to create them. And today I propose to consider what earthquakes are, why they occur and where it happens most often, is it possible to predict them and what consequences they may have. And if you dig deeper, 
find out why our planet gives out a mysterious seismic pulse, known as a microspace, every 26 seconds with the accuracy of a meter. We will tell you about all this and much more in this issue. And, of course, share your thoughts and observations. So, an earthquake is a shaking of the Earth's surface as a result of a sudden release of energy in the lithosphere of the solid shell of the planet, creating seismic waves. Earthquakes can range in strength from so weak that they cannot be felt, to strong enough to destroy entire cities. On the Earth's surface, earthquakes can manifest themselves not only by concussions, but sometimes by displacements of the ground. When the epicenter of a strong earthquake is at sea, the seabed can shift enough to cause a tsunami. Earthquakes can also cause landslides and sometimes volcanic activity. What causes an earthquake and where do they occur most? As we know, the Earth has four main layers, the inner core, the outer core, the mantle, and the crust. The crust and the top of the mantle make up a thin hard shell of the surface of our planet, like the skin on the human body. But this skin is not whole, it consists of many pieces, like a puzzle covering the surface of the Earth. Moreover, these puzzle pieces, called tectonic plates, continue to move slowly through the hot plastic magma, sliding past and bumping into each other. Plate boundaries consist of many faults, and most earthquakes in the world occur along these faults. Since the edges of the plates have a non-smooth structure, they get stuck while the rest of the plate continues to move. Finally, when the plate has moved far enough, the edges of one of the faults move away and an earthquake occurs. That is, while the edges of the fault stick together, the rest of the block moves, the energy that usually causes the blocks to slide relative to each other accumulates. When the force of the moving blocks finally overcomes the friction of the jagged edges of the fault, and it departs, all the accumulated energy is released. This energy radiates outward from the fault in all directions in the form of seismic waves, similar to rowan trees on a pond. There are several different types of faults. When a part of the Earth's crust shifts to the side, the result is a horizontal movement along the zigzag fault. The most famous example is the San Andreas Fault in California, which extends for about a thousand kilometers. The up and down movement in earthquakes occurs under the so-called shear fault, when the soil above the fault zone is either lowered by a normal fault, or pushed up, reverse fault. And faults that are combined with lateral movements up and down, seismologists call inclined. It happens that an earthquake appears after human actions, entailing the weakening of rocks, there is an increase in the number of aftershocks in oil and gas production sites, as well as in the locations of mines and quarries. The construction of reservoirs also has a negative impact due to the fact that water destroys rocks under high pressure due to the water column. Earthquakes are recorded by seismographs. The recording they make is called a seismogram. The device has a base firmly fixed in the ground and a free-hanging heavy load. When the earth is shaken, the base of the seismograph also shakes, but the suspended load does not. Instead, the spring or rope on which it hangs absorbs all movement. Thus, the difference in position between the shaking part of the seismograph and the stationary part is recorded. The strength of an earthquake depends on the size of the fault and the magnitude of the displacement along this fault. But this is not something that can be simply measured using, say, a tape measure, since the fault is located many kilometers below the surface of the earth. The same records are used here to determine the oscillation scale. Among the main characteristics of an earthquake are the following. The depth of the hearth is usually in the range of 10 to 30 kilometers, sometimes much deeper. The magnitude is measured on a scale from 0 to 9 points. An increase by 1 means that the amplitude of the oscillation has a tenfold increase, and the energy of the earthquake increases 30 times. And also the intensity on the Earth's surface depends on the magnitude, the depth of the hearth, the distance from the epicenter and other factors. The strength of the tremors is also measured in points on a scale from 1 to 12, 
where 12 is an indicator of a serious catastrophe when even powerful structures are destroyed. Seismograms are also useful for determining the location. In this case, it is important to be able to see the so-called pi wave and C wave, which shake the earth in different ways, passing through it. Pi waves are faster than C waves. And it is this fact that allows us to tell where the earthquake was. To understand how this works, you can compare the waves of pi and C with lightning and thunder. The sweater spreads faster than sound, so during a thunderstorm you will first see lightning, and then hear thunder. Consequently, the pi waves propagate faster and shake the earth where you are first. This is followed by the C wave, which also shakes the earth. If you are close to an earthquake, the pi and C waves will come one after the other. But if you are far away, there will be more time between them. Looking at the time between pi and with waves, you can determine how far from this place the earthquake occurred. However, if we draw a circle on the map around the station, where the radius of the circle represents a certain distance to the earthquake, then we will know that the earthquake is located somewhere on the circle. But where exactly? Here the triangulation method comes to the rescue. This method helps to determine exactly where the earthquake occurred. The method is called triangulation because a triangle has three sides, and three seismographs are required to determine the location of an earthquake. If you draw a circle on the map around three different seismographs, where the radius of each of them is equal to the distance from this station to the earthquake, the intersection of these three circles will be the epicenter. But is it possible to predict the time of occurrence of an earthquake? Unfortunately, no. To date, many different ways of predicting earthquakes have been tried, but none of them has been successful. Concussions and ground ruptures are the main consequences of earthquakes, mainly leading to more or less serious damage to buildings and other rigid structures. The severity of local consequences depends on a complex combination of the magnitude of the earthquake, the distance from the epicenter and local geological and geomorphological conditions that can enhance or reduce the propagation of waves. Ground rupture. This is a visible rupture and displacement of the Earth's surface, which in severe cases can reach several meters. Ground rupture poses a serious risk to large engineering structures, such as dams, bridges and nuclear power plants, and requires careful quartering of existing faults, which can lead to the destruction of the Earth's surface during the lifetime of the structure. Also, along with strong storms, volcanic activity, coastal wave attacks and forest fires, earthquakes can lead to instability of the slopes, leading to landslides and huge tsunamis. If everything is clear with this, then something still haunts. These are mysterious vibrations on Earth that occur every 26 seconds. Back in the 60s, geologist Jack Oliver recorded a rather unusual microspace, which repeats with a frequency of exactly once every 26 seconds. The phenomenon is called the pulse of the Earth. The researcher realized that the source of not strong, but with the accuracy of repeated tremors is somewhere in the South Atlantic. Most of the scientists' work consisted of analyzing printouts, but Jack found out that it was about surface acoustic waves. He further clarified the frequency. It ranged from 20 to 28 seconds and the total duration of the microseismic storm, which reached up to 8 hours. At that time, Oliver did not have the advanced tools that modern seismologists use. Since then, Scientists have spent a lot of time observing this phenomenon and even managed to determine the exact place of its origin. This is a place in the Gulf of Guinea, known as Boney Bay. One of Oliver's hypotheses explaining the cause of the microseismus was that the phenomena could stimulate ocean waves, and the other was reduced to magmatic activity. Almost two decades later, in 1980, Geologist Gary Holcomb also drew attention to the mysterious seismic activity, noting that it intensified during storms. The same microcyst was registered for the first time on modern equipment. The researchers again clarified the location and found several possible sources at once in the same Gulf of Venice, suggesting that the phenomenon could explain the special configuration of the continental shelf. 
However, another version appeared in the response scientific article of Chinese colleagues of the same year. Researchers have linked recurring microcisms with volcanic activity on the island of San Tommy there, in the Gulf of Guinea. The peak amplitudes of this ripple season, and the maximum. During the winter in the southern hemisphere, indicating an atmospheric or oceanic origin. The conclusion suggests itself that the Gulf of Guinea is a kind of center of the world, since it is in this place that the points of intersection of the equator and the zero meridian are located. There is no doubt that our planet can be considered as a living system that behaves in many ways like a living organism. The Earth breathes through fractures in the crust, and its heart beats, manifesting itself by rhythmic vibrations. There are still a lot of things in the world around us that science has yet to study and explain. Let's hope it happens sooner rather than later. And this will help seismologists move not only to the descriptive phase, but also predictively. In any case, each of us must understand how important it is to take care of our planet, because at the moment it is still the only home, the only place in the universe where we are able to enjoy a wonderful opportunity to live. Mercury is a planet of the inner group of solar systems, and also concurrently the closest planet to the Sun. These features make it difficult to study. Unlike other planets, Mercury never strays far from the horizon of the night sky. We can observe it from the ground for a short time after sunset in the west, or in the east in the morning, before dawn. Photographing Mercury is definitely not an easy task. Of course, this can be done from Earth, but even if the largest and most modern telescopes are involved, it will be quite difficult for us to distinguish details on the surface of this planet. Even the Hubble telescope didn't look at Mercury. It's all about its proximity to the Sun, and this carries risks. If direct sunlight accidentally falls on the telescope mirror, all optical systems will burn out. And it's scary to think about a person's eyes at all. Therefore, the administrators of the telescope's management have never allowed Hubble to be used for Mercury observations. Measuring the mass, establishing the exact period of rotation, the first high-resolution images of Mercury were obtained only thanks to the development of radio astronomy. And radar and radio astronomical research methods help to establish the surface temperature, for example, on the side facing the sun is surprisingly large, about 430 degrees Celsius, but at the same time on the reverse side it can drop to minus 163 degrees Celsius. Due to the low inclination of the pole axis, it never receives sunlight and has a temperature of 183 degrees Celsius. It was also possible to map Mercury from 210 degrees to 350 degrees of longitude. But we are interested in something else, the launches of spacecraft to Mercury, operating in the automatic mode of interplanetary observation stations, has become one of the most accurate methods of studying the smallest planet in the solar system. By the way, all autonomous vehicles launch their fly one way. Their tasks are to receive and transmit to Earth all possible data about the object under study. The first space probe to Mercury, sent in 1973, was Mariner 10. It was the first spacecraft to use a gravitational maneuver. He explored the environment, 
the atmosphere and took pictures of the surface not only of Mercury, but also of Venus. On the study of Mercury itself, Zahn spent only three flights, but captured up to 45% of the total volume. The device has spent fuel and, by the way, can still rotate around the star. The next in line was the second mission to Mercury, Messenger, launched in August of the 2004 year. The umbrella was fixed in orbit in the 2008 and helped to fill in many gaps left by the first device. With this mission, for the first time, we began to have not only high-quality images, but also details, information about crater ice and an accurate orbital passage. And finally, the third expedition to Mercury BP Colombo started on October 20, 2018, named after the modern Italian engineer, astronomer and mathematician Giuseppe Columbus. The scientist who developed the route for spacecraft to enter the orbit of the first planet made a huge contribution to the success of the previous Mariner 10 missions. It was his calculations a safe gravitational maneuver that puts an artificial satellite into a resonant orbit that formed the basis of the probe's program. The goals of the BIPI Columbus spacecraft are quite diverse. The first is to make a detailed multi-wave map of the surface of Mercury. The second task is to study its chemical composition and structure. The third is to conduct research of the surrounding space. The fourth is to measure the intensity of the magnetic field. The fifth is to monitor the effects of solar wind. And the sixth is to identify and map areas of the polar regions containing ice and hydrogen compounds. There are a lot of tasks and the mission is very serious, in the development of which the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency and the European Space Agency participated. Two independent spacecraft MRO for surface exploration and MMO for observations of the magnetosphere will study Mercury from two orbits of different heights. The satellites will deliver a flight module to the destination point. By the end of the flight, the devices will lose their coupling and each will go on its own trajectory. Such are the interesting metamorphoses in the plans of BP Columbus. Moreover, the MRO module will deliver to Mercury as many as 11 experimental installations designed to study Mercury itself, its surface, the structure of motion, and so on. It will fly in a low polar orbit at altitudes from 480 to 1,500 kilometers with a period of two and a half hours. But the MMO probe will have to travel in a strong elongated polar orbit. At the nearest point of the orbit to Mercury will be 590 kilometers, at the farthest, more than 11,000 kilometers. At the same time, this module, resembling a tin can, will be spun up to 15 revolutions per minute around its axis. The orientation in space is chosen so that the sun does not heat the top and bottom of the device, and therefore the main impact of the radiation will be on the side surface of the probe, which will constantly be in the shade and will not overheat. At the same time, this rotation will allow you to deploy four 15-meter antennas that measure the electric field and radio waves. The module is also equipped with two 5-meter masts, on which sensors are installed to measure the magnetic field. Five experiments will be carried out on the device to study the space surrounding Mercury. The orbits of space probes will change rapidly due to the gravitational influence of the Sun, so their frequent adjustments will be required. Also, fuel, and it takes up more than 50% of the weight on board, will be required to maintain the correct orientation of the devices so that they do not heat up. It is planned that the devices will work for a year, but with a successful combination of circumstances, it is possible to extend the missions for another year. And we certainly hope for an extension, as it was with many other space probes. But all this is in the future. What is happening with the probe at the moment? The industrious BIPI Columba first approached Mercury and was at a distance of only 199 kilometers from the surface of the planet. The spacecraft was able not only to take pictures of the planet, but also to collect data from all instruments. Black and white images with a resolution of 1024 by 1024 pixels also demonstrate elements of the probe, 
including antennas and a magnetometer. The images were obtained about five minutes after the rendezvous. Since BP Columbus was on the night side of the planet, the conditions for shooting were ideal. The closest image was obtained from a distance of about a thousand kilometers. Several large craters can be seen in many of the images. The surface of the planet was formed billions of years ago as a result of huge outpourings of lava. These lava flows have traces of craters formed by collisions with asteroids and comets. The bottom of some of the older and larger craters were flooded by younger lava flows. There are also more than a hundred places on the planet where volcanic explosions broke through the surface from below. In one of the photos, we see a part of the northern hemisphere of Mercury, turning on their planitza, which was flooded by lava. The plain around the Calvin crater, which is called the Rudaki Plains, characterizes a circular area, smoother and brighter than the surrounding area. Also visible is the Lermontov crater, 166 kilometers wide. Other images show part of Mercury's southern hemisphere. It can be noticed that the surface is covered with extensive frontal planes. The largest, well-visible crater, although partially closed by the probe, is the Haydn crater with a diameter of 251 kilometers. Closer to the edge of the image is the Raphael crater, 342 kilometers long, at the bottom of which there are younger craters of smaller size. With the start of the main scientific mission, the two scientific orbiters of BP Columbus are studying all aspects of Mercury, from the planet's core to surface processes, the magnetic field and the exosphere, in order to better understand the origin and evolution of the planet. The umbrella will map the surface of Mercury and analyze its composition to learn more about the formation of the planet. One theory is that Mercury was originally a mud mantle when it collided with another body. That is why the concentration of iron in the core of Mercury is higher than that of any other planet in the solar system. The Columbus BEE should also help answer questions about how long volcanic activity lasted on Mercury and how quickly the planet's magnetic field is changing. But also for a Mercurian dessert, I suggest you to view and listen to the spectrogram visualizing the effects of the passage Interesting, isn't it? So, what did we hear? The first two separated sounds correspond to the entry of the spacecraft into the shadow of Mercury and the exit from it, respectively. This is due to a change in the pressure of solar radiation on the cosmic ray and a change in the flow of photons hitting the solar panels. Another distinct sound corresponds to an instrument called Phoebus returning to its parking position. Thus ended the flight of the probe near the planet Mercury. But when is the next one? Not soon. The spacecraft is scheduled to enter Mercury's orbit at the end of 2025th year. By that time, Zahn has to go through quite an exciting journey. The transport module, in order to gain the necessary speed, will have to fly near the Earth again and only then it is planned to enter the calculated orbits and begin its main mission. Well, we will look forward to the 23rd of June, 2022 year, when, according to the plan, the next flight of Mercury should take place, as well as
As researchers continue to hunt for exoplanets, they discover many exciting and sometimes frightening worlds that never cease to amaze us. We offer to make a flight to the most incredible planets ever found. And we will begin our journey from the planet Poltergeist or PSR by 1257 Psi. The exoplanet is located about 2,300 light-years away from us, in the constellation Virgo. This is the first planet of the three orbiting the pulsar. Yes, it is the pulsar, and not the stars, like the Sun, which is something incredible and to see this is undoubtedly a great success. Of course, there was once a pulsar star 25 times the size of our Sunday. But one day it outlived itself and collapsed. So its core turned into a neutron star. One of the densest objects in the universe. The matter in it is so dense that one of its matchboxes weighs 3 billion tons. The magnetic field of these monsters is a thousand times stronger than the Earth's. They turn at a speed of up to several hundred times per second. Neutron stars emit electromagnetic rays, thereby bringing down an incredible amount of radiation. How at the same time the planet did not descend from orbit and did not become wandering? Big question. It is removed from the parent star at a distance of only 0.36 astronomical units. The circulation period is about 66 days. The pulsar planet is four times more massive than Earth. Of course, the world on such a planet is quite extreme because the magnetic field of a neutron star is a source of high-frequency radiation and accelerates elementary particles. This means that the strongest rain of ions falls on the planet all the time, which will have a bad effect on your skin. In such conditions, no biological species can survive, but pulsar, quite. The second planet worth considering is the hottest at the moment. It is located in the constellation Cygnus at a distance of about 620 light-years from us. The exoplanet orbits a main-sequence star of spectral class A, Kelt 9. Of course, how much the planet heats up depends primarily on how close it is to its parent star. For example, in our solar system Mercury is the planet closest to the Sun. The temperature on its daytime side reaches about 430 degrees Celsius, while the Sun itself has a surface temperature of 5,500 degrees Celsius. But stars more massive than the Sun burn harder. The star Kel9 is two and a half times more massive than the Sun, and the temperature on its surface is almost 10,000 degrees Celsius. The planet of the star Kel9 by is located much closer to it than Mercury is to the Sun. The planet orbits its sun every day and a half. For reference, Mercury's orbit takes 88 days. As a result, the temperature on the planet is 4,300 degrees Celsius, hotter than many stars entering the size of the sun. The rocky planet Mercury at this temperature will be a molten drop of lava. But Kel 9 by is a Jupiter-type gas giant. Under the influence of such temperatures, molecules in the atmosphere of the planet disintegrate into their constituent atoms and burn together with its inhabitants. If you feel hot, then it's time to cool off a little. And the coldest world will help us in this. Planet Angle 2005 by LG 390 pound. The exoplanet is located in the constellation of Scorpio and was one of the most distant from the Sun of all known planetary systems. It is located almost 25,000 light-years from us. The temperature on the planet is minus 223 degrees Celsius. With a mass five and a half times that of Earth, the planet is rocky. And despite the fact that the exoplanet is at a distance from its star about the same as Mars is from the Sun, it is not able to warm the planet because its star is a cold red dwarf with a low mass. In such conditions, the planet cannot support the atmosphere, which means that most of the gases have been frozen, there is a force in the form of precipitation, like snow on the surface of the planet. Yes, it's a cold world with no prospects for the future. 
and we continue our journey and are approaching another amazing planet. The huge planet is located only 67 light years from Earth. The parent star of this giant planet is a brown dwarf. The circulation period is 246 days. The giant has the name Danny Spy GE082303. Its mass is 29 times that of Jupiter, making it the most massive planet ever discovered. It is so huge that the question still hangs whether it can be called a planet or classify an object as a star. Yes, the size of this planet is undoubtedly amazing. What about the smallest planet? Yes, and there is one. The planet is located in the constellation Lyra at a distance of about 210 light years from us. Shorty has the name Kepler 37 by, this is an exoplanet slightly larger than the Moon and slightly smaller than Mercury. The diameter of the planet Kepler 37 by is about 3,900 kilometers. The planet is located very close to its star 0.1 astronomical unit, making one revolution around the mother star and planet in 13 days. The average surface temperature is 420 degrees Celsius. The surface of the planet presumably consists of stone materials. The planet has no atmosphere, so normal life cannot exist there. Meanwhile, we are approaching the planet Staryx, which is estimated to be 10 billion years old. The object orbits one of the oldest stars in the Milky Way and is located 280 light years from Earth. The planet is one and a half times larger than Earth, three times more massive than it and orbits the star that is 561 with an orbital period of 10 hours. According to average estimates, the surface temperature is 2400 degrees Celsius. At the same time, it is always turned to the local sun with one side. This discovery indicates that rocky planets can exist for a very long time, remaining stable. The density of the planet is comparable to the Earth, which indicates that it consists of light elements and is consistent with its age. Heavy elements are formed in the bowels of stars and are ejected into space with their death, including during supernova outbreaks. Therefore, the oldest stars have low metallicity, that is, they contain few elements heavier than hydrogen. Similarly, any ancient planets also cannot contain many heavy elements. And to finish our marathon is a planet with the most terrible weather imaginable. Meet the exoplanet HD 189733 by is located in the constellation of Chanterelle, known as Hot Jupiter. The planet is located 63 light years away from us. The distance from the planet to the star around which it rotates is 10 times less than the distance between the Sun and the planet closest to it, Mercury. It turned out that the weather conditions on it are extremely inhospitable. The temperature reaches 3000 degrees Celsius, and the wind speed is 2 kilometers per second. The extremely high temperature in the planet's atmosphere causes the giant to lose up to one ton of weight every second. This is the most extreme diet. No one has ever lost weight so quickly. It was also found that Kremlin particles rise into the atmosphere during storms, turning into molten glass due to high temperature. Clouds of molten silicates and iron droplets were also found here, that is, iron storms are not uncommon on the planet. It will be extremely difficult to survive there, even if you take a lock with you. Yes, it was a curious journey. Amazing. The night sky and those luminous dots that dot it have since ancient times attracted the attention of a person and fascinated him. Even in the most ancient times, people try to understand what is behind this stunning beauty. But looking deep into space, we saw that this beauty can be very frightening. 